everyone, and welcome to the Nanog 90 Hackathon introduction. Uh, hope you're all doing well and excited to participate. We'll be doing a quick walkthrough of what you can expect from the hackathon, some times and logistics, ways to communicate, and effectively like our uh, theme for this time around. So first, uh, I want to give a thank to our sponsors. We can do this without their support, Flex Optics, AWS, and Container Lab. The hackathon is part of Nanog's educational mission. Uh, these sponsors help us fulfill that mission. Our goal is to provide this experience such that knowledge can be shared amongst participants to help them foster new ideas that will help the community and the participants learn and grow. So a uh, quick overview of the hackathon uh, location and time. Uh, all times provided will be in Eastern Standard Time or UTC minus five. So we're going to be having the competition hours or the start of the hackathon at 11 a.m. on February 11th. And the competition will go until 4.30 p.m. Uh, we will not have a room, excuse me, at the uh, conference hotel until 2 p.m., um, but please at 2 p.m. come hang in the room with us. So we'll be able to start virtually, um, but then, you know, depending if you're not on site yet and still on your way to Nanog or you couldn't make it out and you just want to participate virtually, or if you're actually in person, um, you know, we're providing multiple ways for you to interact. And then at 4.30, uh, we'll have the room for another half hour to kind of wrap up and uh, go over scores and prizes. A little foreshadowing here to uh, how we're shifting things up this time. Um, mentors, or effectively the hackathon committee uh, part of Nanog, will be available for support between 11 a.m. and 4.30, or effectively to close. And then the room on Sunday is Mecklenburg uh, 2 and 3 at the conference hotel, the Le Meridian in Charlotte. Um, we'll also have some beverages and snacks for you guys um, in the room. So uh, we're not going to have a full on lunch, but you know, we'll have some snacks and pop and stuff. So uh, ways to communicate with not only the mentors, but the rest of the participants. Uh, Slack is the primary way. Everyone should be a member of the Nandog 90 Hackathon Slack channel, uh, Slack working space. If you're not, um, feel free to either email us or you know you can raise here in chat as well. Um, once you're a part of that Slack, you can use at mentors to contact anybody on the committee for support or any other concerns that you may have. Um, we kindly ask that you do not use the at here or at channel uh, mentions as uh, that can kind of disrupt people in their work or their, their flow, uh, context switching and whatnot. And uh, you know, we suggest that before uh, you know you start the actual competition, that you have an up-to-date Zoom client, uh, especially if you're participating remotely. So the theme this time around, you know, we we kind of took a break uh, the the last Nanog to really um, ingest feedback, understand what the community was looking uh, for us from us rather, and uh, how we could improve. And this time around, we're uh, going to go uh, to a challenge style based of hackathon. Essentially, you'll have a variety of network problems to solve in different scenarios. So each scenario will have an objective or be broken in some way that requires you to troubleshoot and resolve it. And then solving or fixing each scenario uh, will score points. We'll talk about infrastructure a little bit more in depth towards the end of the slide deck, but each scenario will have a collection of routing devices and some number of hosts pre-configured uh, in a topology. Each scenario is going to be worth 10 total points with challenges within or nested within that have their own point value that will accumulate to 10 total points. Um, the scoring is going to be time-based. So effectively, the first hacker or hacker team to successfully complete all scenarios will be the first place winner. Um, the second to complete everything would be second. Third would be third. Um, we're going to give prizes out up until fifth. In the event that a team does not finish all the scenarios, their ranking will be determined by their cumulative total score. So let's say hypothetically, the first team got 100% of challenges answered. Um, you know, they would get first place. But then let's say that second only got 80%. Uh, third would get 75 and so forth. Like, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to solve everything. Um, it'll just be total score and time-based. So that pretty much wraps up the high-level, um, uh, you know, introduction to the hackathon that will be taking place on February 11th. If you've done what, any of the now the hackathons over the past, few years uh you have heard this presentation before uh but if you're not um the basic gist is that we simulate network labs um using uh using uh cloud 
cloud resources. Um, Container Lab is our lab simulation platform, um, which deploys container-based uh, container network OSs uh, in a topology that we define by a YAML file. Um, so it's it's pretty flexible. Um, we've had some we've had good experience. It does have some caveats. Uh, the biggest one is it can only simulate container based um, network OSs when you're running it in a cloud. Um, it has the capability of doing VMs, but you need your own hardware for that because nested is never fun. Um, so uh, we will issue uh, we will issue instances of the lab which is lives on a single ec2 uh, instance on request so approach anyone on the mentors team and we will give you a we will give you a uh, we'll give you a lab instance and uh address and login info um it will have a default ssh key applied to it um if you like we can uh we can you know you're you're free to put your own on there if you need if you see the need to um but you know, as you know, as is, we uh, you know, we're not really concerned about about people logging into other people's instances. But uh, free to listen to people who, if you're more, if you're more paranoid, you're welcome to put your own keys on it. Um, okay, um, next slide. Sorry for the camera angle this time. I couldn't get my external monitors working. Um, okay, so as I said, we will give you a common key. Uh, once you have once you have the instance, uh, you can you're responsible for controlling access to it. Uh, you can put your own keys on if you like. Uh, please be respectful. Don't <laughs> you know, Don't muck with anyone else's work. Uh, and uh, obviously, if we hear about that from anybody, we will not tolerate that behavior. Um, we will give you a v4 and a v6 address for the instance. Um, so uh, yeah, those will be static for the lifetime of the of the hackathon. Um, you know, the, uh, several several ways to access the devices once you are logged into the lab. Uh, one thing you can do is you can create SSH tunnels. Each each container has a management IP, and then you can you can create an SSH tunnel from your desktop to the external address of the instance into the internal management IP of each container. Um, you can also you can do that manually. So you log into the the main OS of the of the Container Lab instance, and then SSH into the containers. Um, Docker Exec uh, works also. That that's that tends that's my preferred approach um, for for getting uh, for getting a command line on the containers themselves. Um, next slide. Okay, um, so this is the primary topology that we've been using. Um, there will be a different topology for one of the scenarios that will be uh, that will be in a document that we will provide um, at the start of the challenge. And as you can see, everything is dual stack v4 v6. Obviously, at the start of most of these, this will not be working. And part of the challenge, you know, the challenge is to get it working. So uh, don't expect full connectivity when in these labs in, in its starting state. And we'll give you a list of things that need to be fixed on each one or enabled on each one to uh, to score points. Simple SSH key management 101. Uh, we will give you a .pem file, uh, copy that into your SSH key directory. Uh, make sure you set it mode 600 or user only access because SSH won't the SSH doesn't work if that key is world readable, um, and then access that key file and reference it in your SSH command to get into the instance. Okay, and here is what this looks like uh, on a command line. So download key, put it in the directory. Uh, I set the key path as an environment variable, and then shown it, shown it, and shmod it. And then once you are there, uh, you reference the reference the key to access the instance in that SSH command that you see in that screen capture. And you should see the, you know, the banner like that. Okay, once once the C lab is live now, one thing is different is that you, you know, because we are using different lab scenarios, um, you will need to deploy each lab um, when you start it. Um, 
you know, this is the capture of the inspect command, which gives you the, the status of the lab after it's been deployed. Uh, but you will want to use the deploy command to reference the topology file. Um, I can I can show you how that works after I go through my slides if we want. Um, but you know, there is a YAML file which defines the topology, uh, what each node, what each node is, any in container specific commands and its scripts serve config locations, and then um, a set that then it defines what ports are interconnected in the lab. Um, and I can show you that as well uh, once we're on this. Like I said, the docs or Docker exec command is my personally personally my preferred mechanism for accessing these. The the trick with Docker exec is that you have to give it a binary to run. You know, you have to give it what to exec. So CEOS and CRPD are the two main uh, two main network oh, containerized network OSs we run. Uh, COS is Arista, CRPD is Juniper, um, and they both have different different uh, command line executables. You'll notice they're almost the same, except that Arista capitalizes the word CLI. If you're logging into one of the Unix instances, uh, you just use bash as your exec command. And here's an example of what you'll see if you do that on a COS machine, a COS container, uh, just run the, uh, you can run the Docker exec dash it for interactive, uh, the name of the container, and then the CLI, and then you will, you know, you will get a prompt. Uh, make sure you go to enable in COS, and then go from there. You know, it should look exactly like a real router at that point. If you're not familiar with Arista CEOS, um, but you, if you've got any familiarity with with Cisco, you will see thing. You will see things that look very similar. You know, almost all of the show commands are going to be identical to their iOS counterparts and you know NXOS and you know Cisco uh, you know, other Cisco OSs, except for maybe XR. Um, you know, configuration mode on in EOS um, has two different modes. Uh, the first is extremely similar to the classic iOS style con con you know configuration terminal um, where commands take effect as you type them. So that is the quick and dirty way to configure things, uh, not the most elegant. The other option is configure session, which is uh, more Juniper-like where you you execute your, you enter in your configuration commands and then commit them in one shot, which works very, which is very similar to, uh, to Juniper's uh, configure mode. The one major difference I'll point out is that Committing a config on EOS does not save the config as startup. Uh, you still need to run the right mem command in order to do that. Just keep that in mind if you're looking to persist your configurations. And just as a side note, Container Lab does persist startup configs. We have we have the lab if if the way that we have some labs set up is that there's a startup config defined in the topology file, and if that's the case. Um, it will come up with that configuration every time. If you have a topo if you have a um, a node defined in the in the YAML that does not reference a startup config file, then the configuration will persist from iterations of the lab. So if you stop the lab and start the lab, uh, the config will be the same as as it was last saved when you shut down the config. I believe most of our topologies use startup configs, so that if you stop and start the config, it will roll back to the predefined uh, version, but you can always edit the file to change that. CRPD is almost Junos. Um, it is the RPD daemon running on Linux, so it's not the BSD OS that classic Junos is. Most most CLI commands work the same. You know, definitely, you know, routing, you know, routing oriented, so show route, show protocols, all work as you expect. Some don't. Um, the ones that would probably surprise you the most is that you know Unix commands like ping and trace route don't work at the RPD command line. What you can do is one of two things: you can run start shell at the RPD command line, which will drop you into the Linux shell, which you know, the bash shell, which you can run those commands. Um, or if you enter the container uh, referencing bash instead of CLI, um, you can run them there as well. And also you can, 
you can run the CLI daemon from Bash. So you can do a Docker exec to a CRPD for Bash, and then from there, start up the Junos, the, the RPD environment by running CLI. And that will and that will bring that up, and then you can exit out of that if you want to run Unix commands. So you can go both ways there. So there is a scenario file. This is so this is the this is the the uh, container lab topology, and uh, most of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, there's also a graphite instance that launches on this, which is why you have these labels here. Um, so you can access that as well. Uh, but yeah, you know, the main thing to be aware of is that. Uh, there is a startup config defined, so we we define a kind in the topology which maps the COS keyword to a to a Docker image in the uh, local, you know, that's stored locally on the on the on the server. Um, we define our nodes, so this is a very simple two leaf two spine topology. Um, each device has its own management v4 management address. Uh, which you can use for SSH tunneling. Uh, and then we've got two servers. Uh, these servers have an init script that uh, that assigns its address uh, in, in and route, in routing table. So these are fairly fairly straightforward as far as how these are defined. It's been, this is you know, this is the name of the node. This is what type it is, and if it's a router. Here's where its startup config is. If it's a server, uh, this is a file to to volume mount, to bind mount, and then a script to run. And here's the definition for the graphite instance. So you can get to port eight zero eight zero on the on the host once it's up, so you can see a topology. Um, here we have endpoints defined, which is you know, which is you know, leaf one has a depth, you know, eth one on leaf one connects to server one, eth one on leaf two connects to server two, and then here are the leaf spine interconnects. So these will, these these interface names will translate directly in EOS. Um, that is not true for all uh, container network operating systems, um, but it's true for, in the, in this, this particular instance, it's true for, for COS. I think CRPD can, you know, gives it and gives it a, a there's a Linux mapping and then their CRPD has its own interesting mapping numbering. So just be aware of that. Um, again, if you want the configurations to persist uh, and not roll back to the startup config, if you ever have to stop and restart the lab, just remove this startup config line or comment it out. Uh, and then if you do that and then save the configuration, if you redeploy the lab, it'll start back up where you found it, where you left it. Each lab is going to have its own folder under OpsC lab in the uh, in the directory. So, in order to deploy the lab, um, you will use the deploy keyword, and then you will point it to the topology file, and this will this will bring up all the devices in the lab. These post deploy actions can take a minute or two. So, do Jeopardy music. Yeah, and this just takes into account the time that it actually takes to to initialize, you know, for COS to initialize itself, because uh, you know, inside the container, it's it's more or less firing up an entire operating system, or at least a reasonable simulacre of one. Oh, here we go. All right. So oh, we have a new version of container lab. I will hold off until after the hackathon to update that. So. Yeah, you know, we have our topology defined. Um, each each container has an idea. You can also use standard Docker commands to see these. So Docker PS will bring up the the same uh, containers. Uh, now, if you want to see one, um, so just just to note, this particular lab is only CEOS. Um, but we can log into one of these. the CLI command, go to enable, and then all of your standard interface commands work. So we can see interfaces, we can see a, a EOS version. Steve, is, 
this is the latest revision, right? I grabbed the latest one from the site that is, a couple weeks that ago. That is the latest, yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And then you can see it's see the configuration that's currently applied. You know, simple show run works the same you'd expect. Um, yeah, basically all the all the same commands that you would run on a real box and very very similar to what you would expect to run on a Cisco uh, Cisco device. We will have people who can answer questions on these if needed. You know, we're here to help. So if you get stuck, feel free to reach out and, and ask questions. We will answer them as best we can, and uh, hopefully we can all we can all learn something. Okay. Um... Well, I guess we'll uh, ideally hear or see from you on February 11th. Like I said at the beginning of the call, if anybody is not currently a part of it, feel free to email us um, and or you know, chime in right now and we can help you get you set up. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on February 11th. Mm -hmm.